Sue, Marco, thank you very much for joining me for this conversation today. And it's a real pleasure to have your personal insights as to how you've made the supervision relationship work well uh, during Marco's curacy. And I'm, I'm very conscious that the CMD staff in the training Commons residential, we, we teach a little bit of theory about the different dimensions of the supervision relationship. We talk um, a bit about assessment and about ways of ensuring that all the important dimensions are kept in place. But at the end of the day, supervision is a very personal matter and we'll bring our personal styles to it. And I think it's really helpful for other people to hear what some of their colleagues have found useful, have found enjoyable, and have found refreshing. So Sue, I'm going to dive in and ask, um, how have you and Marco got good supervisions going, especially at the beginning of the QC? Well, I, I think we've in a way uh, been very blessed because I think it was obvious even a stage back from that in the stage of discerning whether we wanted to work together that that we had um, good chemistry um, and so it has proved and one of the things we picked up on very very quickly is we're both very direct people and we actually began by saying that we would be direct with one another and if things came out a bit brutal almost, th then we would accept that, that that was actually kind of part of the process. Um, so we did establish some ground rules at the very beginning, and that was one of them. Um, another of them was that we would actually stick to time for our supervisions, which, which is actually for the sake of both of us. And another is that at the very beginning, we very much engaged with constructing and then working with the annual training and development plan. And the reason we did that is that it's not an end in itself, but it actually keeps the conversations focused. It actually keeps them kind of on, on the straight and narrow and, and doesn't allow us to sort of wander off in, in, in any direction. And we've also, from the beginning, read together. And we've therefore always, in the beginning, made sure that theology is part of the conversation. Because, after all, that is, is what we're all about. Um, and, and I think I will consciously ask a, a question that is about the presence of God in our conversation and and in our in our ministry. So thanks that's really helpful and I wonder if I can um, jump in and ask Marco now. Marco you came to Curacy with a considerable um, track record um, and a uh, wealth of experience really but what's been especially good or liberating or joyful or encouraging about your work with Sue and supervision? Well, I suppose probably the first thing that um, that really surprised me in a positive way was the fact that uh, when the diocese was discerning, uh, or I mean, uh, I suppose the Archdeacon also had a great deal of in input all of, in all of this, it was a perfect match. And actually, Oh, so I was really surprised how it worked so well, and I was placed in a in a place in in um, in a parish uh, with the right incumbent, and so really things worked well, um, and so far, uh, I've I've been teasing Sue uh, um, during curiosity, saying, "Well, I'm still waiting for that that uh, moment with I either I will disappoint you or you'll disappoint me, and and we we might have like a really." Um, I mean, some some sort of a heavy stuff going on between of us, because you you always hear some, you always hear the the negative stories, the horror stories between the curate and the training incumbent. So in that sense, I'm still waiting for that moment, and hopefully it will never happen. Obviously, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, but um, you mentioned a bit a bit the track record and uh, let's just say experience in 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 in, in my ministry before. 
Um, I think I was aware of the fact that could be either positive or could be also a stumbling block in a sense that probably I'm a little bit more exper experienced than the average curate. Uh, and if and that could be in the way of our relationship, if somehow I think that, oh, I know certain stuff and therefore I don't have nothing to learn. But I started the relationship with with an openness and, and the willingness to, to learn. I think that's a key issue. Because obviously we we don't know everything, and 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 I and I, I and I found out so many new things and so important things in in, in curiosity and and the the input that Sue gives me. It's really important for for my ministry to develop and to to flourish. So um, openness and willingness. I mean, I would say in a, in a way humility. Yeah. Um, maybe I'm not the most humble of of, of guys. Uh, but uh, I'm I'm willing to learn I'm, and I'm willing to to really see what's what can I get from 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 Sue uh, what can I gain from her experience and in a way um, in the future when I become an incumbent uh, avoid some pitfalls or or um, apply more or less the same pattern of um, of um, experience as she has. That's really great. Thanks, Marco. And I, I'm you know I'm conscious that. Um sometimes people can themselves become training incumbents quite quickly after curacy. So I'm, I'm guessing that you'll be taking some of that experience that you've had with Sue into that next stage. And, um, and I know that uh, you're being given some opportunities and considerable um, challenges to lead a, a new mission project to that part of New York. Anyway, we'll leave, we'll leave that bit out of the conversation for the time being. But um, Sue's already mentioned the importance of reading together and keeping theology in the supervision conversation. Now, I get to eavesdrop on that a little bit when I read your uh, portfolio reflections, which I'm really grateful for that you send to me very regularly. And I know that you do include uh, theological elements in those how would you say, um, and perhaps Mark in first and then back to Sue, how would you say that theological element flows within the supervision? Is it one of you introduces it? Is it either of you? Tell us a little bit about the practicalities of that. Mm. Um, in terms of suggesting readings, I think we are more or less like it's like 50 50. Um, either if Sue, I'm, if Sue comes up with a suggestion, I also maybe the following uh, afterwards, I come up with a, an, a, a reading, a book for for the for a next stage of um, theological reflection. Um, I would say because Sue is much more experienced and knowledgeable of, um, I mean, in the theological field, that probably she has a little bit more of input in terms of how the conversation goes. And, and and then again, so from that kind of interaction, I I learn a lot, and I'm being constantly challenged in my presuppositions, in my knowledge, um, and um, I mean, I get from her. I, I hear of theologians that I that probably I should know now, <laughs> or but that I've never heard before, and therefore um, it's 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 um, mind stretching, but it's also very good. Because it keeps me, um, I mean, alert and 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 sharp and and always once again open to the novelty uh, in terms of th uh, theology. So I would say probably Sue, at least her input is sixty or seventy percent in all of these conversations. And Sue, can I just bring you back in on that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> how does it work? How does it work in the nitty gritty? Um, well, I think it works just with the right question at the right time hmm. it could be as simple as where is god in all this hmm. um could, could be as simple as where does this actually connect with what we're reading at the moment and sometimes it actually connects sort of very very directly um with, with what we're reading um at the moment um and, and we we can actually then observe how that sort of theological framework it, it informs a, a, actually our practice because in fact theology is a practice yeah it, it, it isn't 
a, a theoretical discipline. It is, it is a practical discipline because our faith is not a faith really that to use the jargon is propositional, is about what we believe. But when we talk about believing, it's talking about trusting, mm. about trusting that God is in this. And actually, I try quite intentionally to keep that framework close to our conversations, and particularly when they're actually about very nitty gritty, uh, apparently very practical stuff. They used to describe the archdeacon's role as being about trouble and drains. And actually I read somewhere recently, it is you can't be concerned about the kingdom of God if you're not concerned about drains. Mm. Because if we're serious about the incarnation, then actually, God wants to enable our life to, to flourish in, in every way. And that means sometimes recognising that you have to deal with something very mundane and, and actually a bit boring. But that is the task, that is the priestly task, and that's particularly the priestly task in, in, in parish. Mm. And I, I find it quite useful in this um, to think about monastic rules, particularly the rule of Benedict, but, but also the Franciscan rule uh, uh, as well, to some extent, because actually um, in monastic life, those two absolutely have to be interwoven uh, and in a very structured way, because you have your, you know, you have your daily tasks and you have your, your prayer and you have your times of study. Now, obviously, in parish, it's not quite like that, but I think those monastic rhythms come into our conversation and come into the practice of parish life. And I guess what you're also saying is that even in these days when we've been prevented because of the pandemic from doing a lot of physical praying together, it's the, it's the rhythm and the discipline and the duty of the daily office even if we're only to share, able to share and say the Zoom, that kind of informs the rest of our relationships and the rest of the work that we do together. I, I think that's right. And actually, curiously, um, morning prayer over Zoom has actually been almost more inclusive than it has been live. That's um, be, because we have more lay people involved that's brilliant and the the lay people who are involved have i think i think all of them now um is that right marco i would say with the exception of one, <laughs> oh, yeah, one. <laughs> yeah most of them now have yeah. actually taken a turn at leading that's brilliant which i, I suspect they might not have done if we've been doing it mm. in church mm. but as it were from the comfort of their own living room mm. um they they feel able to do that of course the question that then raises and i think it's the question for all of us is how the learning from these very strange circumstances how it becomes sustainable in whatever the new normal looks oh, like that's um, a really important question yeah if, if i might sort of towards the end of this and we're going to wrap up the conversation quite soon but just jump to the fact that one of the things i've noticed too and that i really encourage and commend to all training incumbents is that I think you're a pretty prompt responder to when Marco has written a reflection and you keep your comments short which is appropriate but you do pick up interesting points to talk about which I'm sure you do talk about and that sort of may include uh, prompting him to look at a particular theological source but it may be actually having some fairly robust conversations, which I guess I, I don't over here. And I, I sort of wanted to kind of draw this bit to a close by asking, um, how are you enriched as a training incumbent by working alongside a colleague in this way? Well, you, you know, you, you cannot teach without learning and you cannot learn without teaching. Mm. But I have learned an enormous amount from Marco. Um, I, I've learned an enormous amount from the conversation that is those theological reflections. 
And I mean, I think it's really important to respond promptly and briefly to those. But I, I've learned a great deal from him about liturgy. Mar Marco has a charismatic background, which I don't at all. Um, but in fact, a charismatic style works exceptionally and surprisingly well with Catholic liturgy. And I have learned from him um, what that looks like. And so I, I'm trying to sort of absorb those lessons. Um, he is very good at challenging me very directly and very appropriately when he when he thinks I need that. And, and that has actually been very useful in, in many, many ways. Um, and he is an excellent conversation partner and, and, and sounding board. Um, he is also very gracious in sharing his expertise. That's lovely. Yeah. So in the final couple of minutes, um, I'm going to ask Sue first, but then back to Marco for the last words. Um, two tips to others that you would strongly commend? So first of all, I, I keep coming back to Psalm 16, my boundaries have fallen in pleasant places. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually reading a book on, on, on boundaries at, at, at the moment. And boundaries are not walls, they're, they're fences with gates. Mm -hmm. and, and boundaries allow good conversation over the garden fence. Absolutely. Establish the boundaries of your conversation uh, graciously and flexibly, um, but, but clearly. Mm. And I suppose the other thing that I would offer is the opening of the rule of St. Benedict, which is listen, my child. Mm. Um, it's a double listening. To, to one another and to God. Mm. Lovely, thank you. And Marco, if you were with the incoming group of soon to be deacons coming to Chelmsford Diocese and they were a bit nervous or apprehensive about supervision with their soon to be training incumbents from, from June, what couple of things would you want to encourage that group of people with? Probably two in one, which is the fact that you should trust uh, the church in her wisdom to um, that she came up with with a fairly uh, good process where people are nourished and, and protected and, and and helped and and trust God because God obviously is in, in all of this in all of this and he he is really gently and in, in sometimes in surprising ways guiding us. Uh, uh, and showing us what we're supposed to do in our in our ministry, mm -hmm. and 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 maybe the last thing is try to enjoy as much your your time as a curiosity and your relationship with your training incumbent because he or she are a great source of uh, experience, and and, and uh, this can turn uh, into um, a good friendship and 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 uh, and um, and a, and and a source of uh, I mean mutual um, uh, strengthening and and encouragement. That's lovely. And, and certainly, um, if I could just add that I continually learn from working with all of you as curates, as training incumbents, especially privileged, I feel sometimes, to read your very considered portfolio reflections because they often bring new insights to me and, and cast a light on, on what I'm doing. So, Marco. Sue, thank you to both of you very much. It's a great pleasure to work with you and it's been a pleasure to share in this conversation today. So go well. Uh, God's blessing to you in your work and your encounters today. And see you in reality, we hope, before too long. God bless. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you, Jill. Bye. Take care.